Okay, well, it's after 12, and I think we probably should get started now. So, um, yeah, I'm Neil Grant, and I'm, I've kind of organised for Stuart to give this lunch and learn today. Um, and you can see the title there. He's going to be discussing the application of discrete element modelling to uh, effectively to geological structures. So let me just give a quick bio on, on Stuart, and then he can uh, start his uh, presentation. So Stuart graduated from Glasgow University in 1984, and uh, he then completed a PhD uh, from Royal Holloway in 1994 on math masking modelling of sedimentation in active tectonic settings. Uh, he was a lecturer at Manchester University from 1998 to 2003, and then moved to the University of Barcelona, where he was a research professor until 2022. And, and I guess now, Stuart, you're, uh, you're working full time on CDEM. But uh, take it away and uh, introduce yourself. Hello. I hope I'll hear me. Um, thanks for that, Neil. Um, I, I remember the, the Grant brothers from Glasgow all those years ago. <laughs> I won't tell you any more about that. I'll get on with this. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, I'm just going to give it, it's mainly going to be, I think, on a, a PowerPoint presentation. And you can see the title here. It's, it's fairly wordy, as ever. Discrete Element Modelling, DEM is the, um, contradic the contraction of an acronym. Using CDEM, which is the only name I could come up with for my code as well, from the expert user high performance computing code to a desktop application. Um, that's me, Stuart Hardy. I've set up a little company. Um, I'm still sort of associated with ECRI at the University of Barcelona. That's sort of a, um, in, a bit fluid, but um, this is what I've been doing for many years now, far too many years probably. Um, and recently it's mainly been with uh, Nestor Cardoso, who's just down the road, um, working on trying to bring scientific research codes, not to the mainstream, but to a much more wider user base. So I'll continue and see what see how this goes. So my presentation, and I think I can use a laser. Oh yeah, this is quite. I've never used Teams before, so you have to excuse my amateurness. And um, this is a little outline here. Um, I'm going to give an introduction, sort of the whys and the wherefores, a little bit about the theory and background of discrete element modelling, not equations and solution schemes, etc. More just about what's the basis of it um, from a kind of outsider's point of view. Benefits, um, why use it? Um, why not use finite element modeling? You know, they, that's a good question and you've got to start by saying why I do this. And um, partly from my point of view, it's because I find it interesting, but that's personal. Current status, where are we? Why are we doing this? What are we doing? And then go on to the type on the scope of the simulations that CDEM. It's called CDEM because it was discrete element modeling and the original code was written in C. And I could not, for the life of me, come up with an acronym, so I thought C DEM. Very, you know, not very inventive, but it works. And um, we're going to look at example applications. How do we use this code? And then some kind of summary and outlook as to where we're going, what we see maybe happening next, and uh, what does the future hold? Okay, so discrete element modeling in geoscience in general has typically been seen as the domain of the expert user. Um, you know, it wasn't every geologist would say, oh, I'll just do some discrete element modeling. It's never going to be quite like that, obviously. But it's not been a tool, unlike perhaps kinematic modeling, that you could go to and use Move or whatever to get some ideas, do some what's if modeling. And it's typically, up until recently, and still in many ways, employed very expensive, often seat licensed, software um, that has really entered the realms of high performance computing. Uh, in other words, before you can even use it, you need, absolutely need a very high end piece of kit that the software then gets installed on, et cetera. And essentially our attitude has been, we don't want to do that. So I'm going to present our geologically centered. Um, essentially our discrete element modeling is for geologists written by geologists approach to discrete element modeling. It's called CDEM. And it's really a suite of codes, um, all based on a, um, 
nut or a kernel um, that's the, basically the computational engine that allows modeling of structure and stratigraphy, which is, I guess, what many of us are interested in um, at a variety of scales. And in many ways, with a rich capability, looking at boundary conditions, normal faulting, extensional, contractional, calderas, you know, a whole pile of different boundary conditions and therefore geological settings. Um, rheologies, frictional cohesive, linear elastic, viscous, be it what you will. And most importantly, um, post-processing and analysis, it's all very well running a model that's very elegant. But you've got to be basically be able to examine it and perhaps throw it away, um, interrogate it, data mine, and look at what the maximum you can extract from it, be that stress, strain, displacement. And all of this, our hope, aspiration is to be run on desktop machines. This is just a very simple example with the type of uh, diagram you're going to be seeing with, in this instance, the normal fault with some pre-growth, that's, I think, in this instance, about 200 meters thick, and some growth strata with my usual hideous color schemes, but if nothing else, you can note it. You note some faults here, some lack of faulting here. This is the boundary condition, essentially. This is the response. In this instance, we've got 50 meters scale here, just to give you a feel. Carrying on, essentially, like all discrete element models, CDEM, we treat a 2D geological section, which is what this is, as an assembly that's a collection of circular, or in 3D, spherical elements, which can have a variety of contact laws. And the idea is that you have a series of um, disks in 2D, or spheres in 3D, and they interact with each other. They can't over-penetrate, they can't just go off into the air, and the, the way they interact effectively uh, defines their mechanical behavior. Um, just like a, a grains of sand, the, the coefficient of friction defines their overall mechanical response. And for the moment, the application, the program, is a MacOS application. That's because it was our background and used to. And it does allow a wide variety of simulations to be set up and run, varying boundary conditions, stratigraphy in the, in the way it varies mechanically. And also we can add growth segmentation or erode as well. They can all be varied or introduced. Um, so here we go. This is actually now a bit of a zoom in. You can see what I'm talking about. The, this particular, in this instance, stratigraphic package here is made up of a series of elements or disks. And you can see the radii is, is variable. And that reduces two things, porosity and also the um, predilection to form um, fracture planes along lattice boundaries and effects. And we've got different colors in this instance, it, this is pre-growth. You see a, what's essentially a fault stroke shear zone here, more faulting here. So it's a discontinuum technique, and that means that there's no, there's no mesh effectively. When you, most numerical modeling, certainly finite element has a mesh, and you're using solution scheme on that mesh. And it's really just an assembly of circular elements that interact in a specified way under the influence of boundary displacements. And so these elements respond to external imposed boundary displacements under the influence of gravity, obviously. And effectively, Newton's equations of motion are solved to result in a velocity, which means that very small movements of individual elements as a result of basement or boundary conditions reset the model, continue, continue. This results in very small time steps. Um, we have to do a lot of solution for both stability and accuracy. So it's computationally demanding, although this is something that, that more and more is becoming less of a concern because desktop machines are now incredibly powerful. The laptop you have probably has at least four cores, if not eight, meaning eight or 16 threads. That's computational um, ability in many ways is, is increasing month by month almost. Why? What's the benefit of, the, of using discrete element modeling? Well, in many ways, um, faults, folds, fractures, uh, and shear zones are a sort of natural part of the system. We, we're not saying there must be a fault here. Yes, we're imposing boundary conditions, but the rest essentially emerges. It's an emergent system. And abrupt, very difficult boundary conditions are very easily handled. There's no problem with meshing as such across this fault here. The lower example here was actually um, 
a simulation where the end walls were moved and it was allowed to flow because we had a essentially a, a frictionless lower material and a, and a cohesive upper material. There's no problem with that, which results in the technique being very stable and adaptable. Um, it means that you can really do quite complex boundary conditions without worrying, will it actually work? Whether it's geologically what you want is another issue. So where are we at the moment with our CDEM? Well, you'll see that we have um, essentially three columns here. We have a computational brain, which is the original code. Um, it's C code. Um, it solves all of the equations, does all the, the nasty, uh, difficult stuff. And it's um, completely um, clean. And it's been paralyzed both in OpenMP and Grand Central Dispatch, depending on the system, Windows, Linux, or Mac. To take advantage of multi-processor, multi-core, multi-thread um, processes that we have today in our computation. Um, the slightly more bells and whistles version is called CDM2D Pro, which can be run essentially headless from a terminal or command line on Mac, Windows or Linux, and it's, it can run on all three. At the moment, the desktop app, uh, which is in green here, like a traffic light, is the one that we have. It's fully functional up and running. Windows is, is in process, aspiration or desire. And you can see that this red arrow here goes both ways. So our desktop app can condition what we do in our more complicated, more uh, computationally demanding model. But the results of this are post-processed analyzed on the desktop. And essentially what makes CDEM stand out in a many ways, from my point of view, and I'm obviously going to say this, is one of its, its ability to import this data. So you have these very high resolution simulations that you can just pull in seamlessly from Linux or Windows or Mac as well. Basically, this can even be done over a network while the simulation is still running. So you can be checking up on a, on a simulation, decide it's not what you want and stop it without having to wait to the end. But the other issue that we discovered quite early on, and this was very much from Nesta, that we encapsulate the whole of the simulation as one document. This instance is the Mac desktop here. And this document contains both all the results, all the model parameters, and the ability to essentially visualize the model as it progresses, post-process it, data mine it. And we can display all sorts of things like displacement, strain, stress, et cetera. And ugly mugs time, I'm Stuart Hardy, and Nesta Cardotho is my co-collaborator, conspirator. Um, and we've effectively done this almost as a kind of crazy hobby for a bit. Um, but now we're very pleased with the results. And OK, enough waffle. I'm going to show you an example, which is actually a screen movie, of the typical manner in which CDM is used. In this instance, on this laptop I'm physically using now, I made a screen movie of it, looking at two different simulations, so two separate documents, in distinct ways. So this is um, my desktop, and that's CDM down there sitting on the dock, as, as any other program will or does. And I'm just going to start this movie, and hopefully it will just pan through it. So CDM opens up, and we've got two windows here that are two simulations that were previously run. And the first one is um, essentially a false scarp collapse simulation that I'll come back to later in this presentation. And I'm looking at it according to a variety of different things. This is essentially total displacement magnitude here. And now I'm taking it back to the start of the model. And the simulation is progressing. This simulation of the basement fault, effectively just releasing a foot wall with no support. The second example, the second simulation, is of essentially a monocline. It's a blind normal fault at depth above a strong linear elastic material. And here we're looking at incremental shear strain. Here we're looking at the, this is still running, while this other experiment is in the background, just we can examine it as we will. And we'll now see, hopefully, this foot wall with a lack of support of any growth strata begin to collapse. And we're displaying this here according to displacement magnitude. So you see these colors change, obviously, as, as the material forms a talus slope. And now um, that's just one example where we had two documents that had previously been imported and saved. And of course, these are just self-contained experiments. 
We can also, over a network, pull in data um, quite dynamically. And I'm going to show that now. Again, CDEM starts. We go to here. This is the typical starting position. I'm going to increase the size of the, the window. I'm going to import a simulation with forces, i.e. stress, from somewhere on my network. I'm connecting here, going to my account, my username. And this is a void. This is an open void, like a tunnel. We're just going to create a tunnel. It's fairly arbitrary, but it shows the idea. So this is the data being pulled in over the network and displayed. And this is completely separate. This was actually run on Mac, but it could be on uh, Linux. It could be on Windows. We create, you can see here, a void. In this instance, the material is quite strong. So the, visually, this void doesn't seem to collapse at the moment. And it just runs. And now we go up and we say, well, actually, I'd like to color this. There's my scale bar. Color it by total displacement. And we can actually see now, yes, there is subtle displacement here. But we might also want to look at the vertical displacement or horizontal. And we can see that this hole is producing a, a displacement field. But perhaps more interesting are stresses. Here's sigma max. OK, I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Now, obviously, you know, sigma max is going to be oriented around this sphere. And this is sigma min, which is also radiating out. I'm going through now some other of the typical stress components. Horizontal. And vertical. Now all of this is essentially contained in the, the document, in the model document. And we can zoom right in to have a look at it in detail. And we'll go back now to Sigma Max, and you can really see the effect of that void. OK, that's an example of just pulling in some data over the network. So what can CDEM actually do? What are the type of boundary conditions and attributes that we might wish to look at? Well, obviously, structure and stratigraphy are our main concern as geoscientists. And both of these can be varied in a time sense. So you, know, you can have tectonics that goes on and then off, pauses or inverts. Stratigraphy, we can add growth strata. That can pause as well, or we can erode. Base level, essentially, it's an accommodation. Where are we adding growth strata? We can fault, fold, fractures, shear zones. That just did, these all come out of the system naturally. The scales we're concerned about, it's for scales read resolution, I guess. Down to the metric, up to much more decametric, where this gives you greater speed, less resolution. This gives you really good resolution, but things are a little bit slower. The attributes, obviously, we're dealing with elements. So that makes it really easy to look at their displacement through time, be that magnitude, horizontal, or vertical components, or also the vectors. Again, this can be incremental or total. So we can look at how far something has moved, how is it moving at this stage of deformation? Moving implies deformation, which implies strain. So we can extract again incrementally or totally the maximum shear strain, dilation, extension, shock, and axis. Stress, as you've just seen, the various components can be extracted with really no great hassle at all. It's, it's very straightforward. The feature set, where this is the bells and whistles version, this is the, the desktop version. Rheology-wise, linear elastic, frictional cohesive, we can extract stress. Uniaxial biaxial test, repose from both. Strain and analysis, if you look at this, is actually done on the desktop, because that's where you typically would like to, to examine your data. High resolution can be on both. Very high resolution for the moment is on the, essentially the headless version. We can look at viscous materials again. Really detailed stratigraphic control for the moment is here. We can do tilting, differential loads, cavities, tunnels, and boreholes, erosion, growth strata on both, varying time variant, and the thing that we're, I'm bringing in now is deltaic and carbonate sedimentation. Rather than just um, 
conceptually this is sedimentation of stratigraphy, I'm going to start building them in according to some at least reasonable empirical basis. And now eventually get on to some simulations where we really see it in action and you'll see the kinds of things that we can not just um, extract but examine and look at. Um, I took this from um, NSC thesis um, that I was, I was given and this is from Iceland and it's in basalts obviously and we, we have a fissure here we have a breached monocline whatever terminology you want to use look at the the width of this fissure the the offset and we have a dipping surface here and the question is can we simulate something this is actually quite a difficult thing to simulate normally numerically you have gaps you have open gaps you have fissures so we're going to simulate here a 200 meter thick basalt above a blind normal fault, which is the scenario that has been suggested here. You're going to use a linear elastic contact law, which produces a material which is a lot stronger in compression shear than in tension, which is the rule for many rocks anyway. And the average element radius, if you look at this here, is you know, three quarters of a meter. So we're looking at very high resolution here. So again, I'm just going to um, launch CDEM and look at this experiment, which is a self-contained document. And this will obviously take a certain amount of time to show, but that's because we're looking at it high resolution, both temporally and spatially. So here's the end result, as you can see, that's nice. I'm just changing the, the scale here. This is a decameter, so that's um, 50 meter scale there. So we've got nearly 46,000 elements. It's about 200 meters thick and about uh, 400 meters initially across that's it this is the initial scenario here and you'll see here that we're beginning to run the model displacements accruing at depth and obviously a linear elastic material effectively initially doesn't break so we have a essentially a breaking strain in here and as you'd imagine the stretch especially in this outer surface here begins to produce and you can see it here nascent fissures you can just see it there and there and now they begin to grow. Now, what's interesting here, I guess, is that the blind fault is growing upwards. You can see quite, quite clearly offsets here, whilst the fissures are growing downwards. And we have a zone in the middle, which is somewhere between the two. And we can see here, we're going to end up, I think, with around 50 meters of displacement. And uh, the, the information in this model run is all kept in this summary panel here. So we don't have to look up some scraps of paper or some other file. This details everything that is in this model in terms of elements, physical constants, run times, rheologies, how often you're displaying, etc. This is the final model result here. I'm going to zoom in now. And we're going to look at what this fissure looks like in the end. We can measure things very clearly. That's, that's fairly straightforward. So this distance here is in the order of 120 meters, 130 meters. The fissure itself is around, that says 16 meters wide. We have a slope here that's around 10 degrees or something. We can measure the width, the aperture here, which comes in at around 10 meters, very similar in the same order of magnitude. And the depth of this fissure, this is a this is a big fissure. I'm not saying it's reality, but this is something that we can very straightforwardly model. Now, that's just geometry. We might actually want to look at the incremental shear strain. That would be over the last five meters of displacement on the boundary fault here. And you can see it's quite a wide zone of deformation. But in the grand scheme of things, if we look at the total strain, which is obviously a, diff a different scale, we see the fault zone here, together with quite a lot of deformation in the footwall before it effectively gave. We're looking in here now at this fault zone, where obviously you have a central core of high shear strain. And by clicking in here, one can, with a little bit of luck, begin to extract shear strain values from various positions. Again, these are all from here. Now, if I go into the blue here, 
I'm seeing the shear strain is 0 0.01. And way out in the foot, the hanging wall, again, it's very low. Okay. So we can do essentially strain transects here. Zooming out again. And I'm going to look at the result and this time colour it by the total displacement, which is essentially where we often view things. And you see the displacement is, it ramps across this fault zone. And there's a zone here clearly that was in the, the foot wall, but it was also part of the monocline before it was breached. Next example. Um, and some of this is, is drawn from what I've seen in the literature, other of it's, the other is from analog models, other things that just interest, is fault scar collapse. This is from a paper, I think it's quite recently, um, by Ken McClay and Associates, and it's from um, the Northwest Shelf in Australia. And it was looking at um, fault scar collapse, so I just lifted that. And what we see here is, or is interpreted to be some hanging wall talus in here, and slide blocks. Fault foot wall collapse, um, but clear onlap onto this after the event, such that there was no support for this foot wall when this was happening. Again, quite a difficult boundary condition to handle numerically. And I'm just going to set it up here. I'm going to simulate essentially a 100 metre thick cover above a normal fault. This is the end result here. We're going to use more Coulomb frictional cohesive materials and again very high resolution. So I'll start this model now. I'm just making it full screen so I can see a bit more. And now we're going to go back to the beginning and see how this actually evolves. So from this point on, pretty soon we start to deform and we see initially we get these precursor faults. They're typically quite short lived. And then because the material is quite cohesive and frictional, we have a fault scarp forming. But unfortunately for it, there's clearly no support here. There's nothing abutting against it. So eventually this head, essentially a load here, will cause failure. And hopefully we'll see that pretty soon. You reach some critical stage, and there it goes. So we see a collapse, and also internally, the collapse wedge deforming and essentially disintegrating. You can see that things are cohesive frictional, and that this poor little guy here didn't collapse and is left hanging. Okay, so now we want to look at maybe what's the strain here at the end. This is the last increment of strain. You can see effectively unstrained, unstrained at this stage, and a talus wedge which is both on the foot wall and the hanging wall here. Now we're running the incremental strain. And you can see the, the very early precursor faults, which slowly but surely just become redundant and not used. And the shear strain coming up, nothing happening in the foot wall yet. Still enough of a support for the physical materials. And we're going to reach a point fairly soon where that cannot self-support effectively. And as this wedge, you begin to see attempts at failure here. Now, some of them succeed, some don't. But eventually, it's a done deal, and we get these rotational collapses. You can see them dying out. This one becomes the main, and it's translating down. Now, this talus slope, as I said, occurs both on the foot wall in this instance and the hanging wall. That's obviously because the, foot, the basement is incredibly rigid. And now we can display the total displacement. And you can see the difference between the, the hanging wall, foot wall and the talus wedge, how far it's been displaced. Following on, this is, I think, it was either a, a Tim Dooley figure after Bruno Vandeville. You can see the scale. This is clearly an analog model where, again, a rigid basement, a, in this instance, um, ductile viscous buffer, 
and some sand, some friction on this instance, both um, growth and pre-growth. With these cl very characteristic, um, apparently reverse faults here and a detached grab and the main fault being here and the grabbing is here. Okay. We're going to simulate this again. It's a 100 meter thick cover, blind normal fault. The lower material here, which has got a slightly different intensity, is frictionless. And again, very high resolution. Basement fault, let's go. See, almost in, immediately you get this um, precursor fault forming here. In this instance, the initially, the fault is not displaced or detached, but as we get more flow and translation of this frictionless material, we begin to see a grab and forming on the football. You can see it very clearly now. And if I colour this model once more again, this is the, the idea that you data mine, you, you examine it, looking at the incremental maximum shear strain, that's over the last five metres. We see an awful lot of deformation around here where this material is flowing, but also you can very clearly see actually two different generations of grab in there. And that's just the displacement magnitude, showing a different viewpoint. Now here's the, the rather large one. We're going to look at planar normal fault now with growth strata. I said we can do growth strata or, or erosion as well. Frictional cohesive cover, Normal displacement on the fault, high resolution. Let's just go with it. Going to show that again, we can look at multiple different, all of the information that, that, that generated this model is contained here. There's nothing missing. So there's no doubts as to exactly what was done. Coefficients of friction, the fact that there was growth sedimentation, etc. So this is the final model result. We don't want to start there. We're going to start at the beginning, surprisingly. And here it goes. This is quite a long model. We see displacement begin to accrue here. We get initially again one of these precursor faults. There's the scale down there. But very quickly we get a, a planar normal fault at high levels. And this is frictional cohesive. You can actually see the red material and here is growth strata. And it's as strong as the pre-growth strata. Hence you get fault scarps and little gaps which are essentially open fissures at the Earth's surface. The different colours here are just increments. There is no rise in accommodation here. The accommodation is solely created by hanging wall um, subsidence. And you see that very quickly this early fault is overtaken by a through going partially elastic fault in the cover. And we note that the displacement on this precursor or earlier fault seems to stop around here. We'll come back to that in a minute. You see that there is quite a lot of complex, almost hourglass faulting beginning to form here, with multiple additions of sediment. As I say, these sediments are as strong as the pre growth. There's no need for that. They could be very weak, which we obviously would produce a different response. But this particular model was run out of personal interest to see how these materials responded to continued deformation. Would this fault? be activated and propagate into the, the growth package, for example. And there's going to be quite a lot of displacement here in the end. This is about 200 metres thick, as I remember it. And we're going to effectively have over 100 metres displacement. So this is not a small amount of displacement relative to the section being considered. We're almost getting there now, about 85. So obviously, as one adds these growth strata, the number of elements in the computation um, increases. And this is the other thing that because it's meshless, there's no issue with adding more nodes to the computation. Obviously, it slows it down a little bit, but these days, as I say, that's not the biggest issue. We can see now there's definitely a hint of faulting here. So we're about to finish. These are not mechanical. This is just purely my uh, color scheme. And we're going to get to about 110 meters. And that's the end of the deformation. Displacement. And now we'll say, OK, well, what more can we get from this rather than just geometry? So we might want to color it. 
by total shear strain. It's a very, very good thing to start with. Here we see it. That's the scale. You can see the precursor fault, the main fault, and a whole pile of what looked like antithetics. Okay. These reaching up into the growth strata. The earlier fault not, and this is the incremental here. You see that most of the activity is in that part of the growth strata there. Now, we don't need to just look at incremental shear strain. This is actually dilation. You can see now a both volume increase and volume decrease fault. That's due to opening and closing. And we see if we look at the total that the dilation associated with the precursor fault stops. It stops at the growth strata. This essentially died. The activity stopped at this point. Now, it's back to Ken McClay again. Um, I don't believe that analog modeling is the be all and end all, but if you're going to compare um, a numerical model, you'd like to compare it against something that's that's known. Boundary conditions are absolutely known, material properties are known. So I'm going to look at non planar normal faults here with growth strata again, either Listrick or ramp, ramp flat. Again, I make no comment about the applicability of the ramp flat model, but it does produce nice results and we can compare if we want to. Constant displacement on the fault. Now, in that sense, that means this mylar sheet, which is pulled. Um, again, at least we know the, the displacement boundary conditions. Average element radius has got, it's increased now, it's nearly 10 metres, because we have around 75,000 elements in this. These are just going to be examples. So, this is the starting condition here. I'm defining this fault within CDM, CDM geometrically, so this is just a function here. And we say maximum fault dip, et cetera, fault tip location here. This is the pre-growth, a little bit of growth added right at the start, no displacement. And the growth itself is added beneath this rising base level, and there is strong once more. 490 metres displacement. So we're talking a lot more displacement here, much bigger scale. That's that distance there. And we can see now we've got a typical growth wedge. Both there's subsidence on the essentially the hanging wall the whole across the whole of it that then fans out and increases in towards the fault antithetic faults here and we go up to almost a kilometer of displacement here's 740 meters again we can see it new faults developing being rotated as well you can see them rotating and two packages here of growth strata are distinguished not through any mechanical thing but just perhaps what one can see within them. We can see quite a lot of offset or apparent offset within this package and not so much in this package. So let's look at the 490 meter instance, if you will. Um, we can look at the incremental maximum shear strain in this instance over the previous four meters of displacement. So this is like 1% of the total displacement at this stage. Here is the actual geometric model. And here is the maximum shear strain going from 0.1 to 0. As you can see, the majority of the model is unstrained, undeformed. Uh, but we can see deformation, obviously, along the mylar sheet, but also very clearly within the growth strata here and here, and faults that are being rotated. And this is at 900 metres, well, nearly 1,000. Again, faulting what appears to be going up into the cover, but actually, when you look at it here, there is really rather a lot of deformation in this zone in here. It's not immediately apparent. And obviously, deformation along and adjacent to the fault plane. Ramp flat, again, I make no, no qualms about saying I don't know if these are like this really. But this is identical boundary conditions. Everything's the same. So the only thing that's changing here is the fault geometry. In this instance, this has been read in from external coordinates. So this could be a digitized fault trace, given the location, lower fault dip, and a flat, a couple of district segments, and another flat. This is the zero displacement case. So this is the starting condition. This is after nearly 500 meters here. And we see really rather an interesting packet set of packages of growth strata, some of which overlap in this direction. Normal faults here, but these strange as seen in analog model, either very steep or verging on reverse faulting here and a, an antithetic fault here. 
at nearly 750 and eventually 998 kilometers displacement. We see two fans here again. In, this package here, this pre-growth package, has continued to be translated and rotated, leading to this rather large anomalous block here. And this is the incremental displacement, again, at the two ex exactly uh, identical stages. And obviously, with the mylar sheet and these curved fault surfaces, you begin to see these arcuate shear surfaces of faults because you're pulling material along this surface. But what we're also seeing is rather a lot of deformation within the growth sequence. Here's this um, normal fault here, extensional fault coming here, which is cutting straight to the surface. This fault here is actually quite active as well. And it's a little bit of boundary conditions here. But we can see these curved fault surfaces here, and that's purely due to the boundary conditions. Further displacement. We've now got this almost isolated block here. We're beginning to see rather interesting little conjugate systems here and a lot of deformation in this one here, which is not here. It's perhaps apparent, but higher in the sequence, it's not. And again, a lot of deformation around this curve of ramp and a lot of deformation within this translating and rotating zone here. Now, Everything that goes down doesn't necessarily stay down. So inversion, and it's a bit of a flavour of the month in certain areas as well, obviously. We're going to look at an inverted planar normal fault here with growth strata. So things can be time variant, as in the sense of displacement can change. There could be a pause, if you will, as well. It's a frictional cohesive column. The, the, the fault itself has, is just a planar fault, so it's constant displacement at depth. Um, again, quite high resolution, around 10 metres and about 75,000 elements in this instance. And here are the two examples. This is 110 meters displacement, end of the extension. So there's not much extension, but there is growth. You can clearly see thickening across this fault, fault which becomes steep towards the Earth's surface. And this is the incremental shear strain over the previous 10 meters. And we see things are fairly predictable. There's a little bit of antithetic faulting in here due to the fact that that fault is steepening. And this is early to mid inversion. You can see this fault invert from 110 meters extension to about 50 meters um, offset in a reverse sense here. So we now see clearly higher than region, higher region, sort of at the same and still a little bit of indication here. You can see the growth package come up and thicken across the inverting fault and the growth sequence of the inversion here thinning and eventually unlapping here. Quite a lot of deformation around the fault tip, the inverting fault tip, but also a hint that deformation is occurring in the previous football. And this is late inversion. And you can very clearly see the football is now being both faulted and folded and rotated. So here's the previous growth package, and here's the thinning inversion package with deformation. And we can see that the foot wall is beginning to fault and collapse as well. And this is just a zoom where we can perhaps see things a little bit clearer. That's an original normal offset there that's been rotated due to activity on this now foot wall fault. And you can see the thickening across and folding in here. And thinning of the inversion package here. The resolution here, that's about 100 meters. Okay, so those are down to maybe 30, 40 meters. Right, um, I'm going to finish up, I think, with looking at, I've talked a lot about strain, but how about stress as well? Um, we're going to look at an open void at shallow depth, going back to the start almost, but we're going to look at it, how it develops and try and extract some information. Again, you see them sitting as a little lap, but doing just a lot more than just a little lap. So we're going to import this, which is a complete experiment. It's called Cavity 2. You can name these to be things that mean something to you. So here's the end result. So I'm going to move this window around a little bit, increase the size, Zoom in. 
and then go back to the start. This is on Sigma min at the moment, but I need to change that. Here we'll go to geometry. So we turn that off, we're back to just simple geometry and now we run the model. I'll look at the viewed results of the model. There's our void and you can see there's an instantaneous shrinking. It's an elastic material, so it fractures, but only not much. It's very strong, very cohesive. So that's the end of it. We can measure it if we want to, just to show you we have a whole series of tools that are built in as well. Look at distances, but probably more importantly, we'd like to look at the various components of stress here. What kind of stress state is this in? So sigma max, as you'd expect, is arching round and enveloping the open void. Sigma min should almost be the, the, the counter side of that. We can see a radiating series of any other name fractures. Again, just looking at different components of stress, you can see kind of almost shadows here. You can see that the surface is here, which has a boundary effect. There is a depth that can't do that. Go back to looking at what I think is probably a little bit more. There, sure, that's 20 meters down there. And that's the actual, that's the, the geometry. So, a little bit of summary here. Hopefully, I've gone through a, a spectrum of things that we can do. And with CDEM and its um, big brother, CDEM 2D Pro. You can simulate a wide variety of geological structures under many different boundary conditions. As simulation is encapsulated as an experiment document, you can share this work with others wherever they are, and you can essentially do it, send it as an attachment. And providing they have the program at the other end, it can be opened and they'll know everything that you did. The pro version, unquote, offers a richer feature set and can be run in your best compute mode. So you have some machine that is really quite a serious machine, you use it. But the important thing is the results can be imported seamlessly into CDEM to make the best of that interface for examining and data mining over a network, even as the simulation is running. And I suppose given that almost is these days almost monthly price performance improvements on desktop machines, never mind laptops, the distinction between these two probably will diminish in the near future. You are reaching HPC levels of performance on desktop and or laptops now. Of course, the HPC definition goes through the roof because they have thousands, of course. The outlook is, given this, we can imagine that this distinction will dim dim diminish. We're going to expand the functionality of both programs. Obviously, uh, geotechnics is a key issue. Uh, we're going to be looking at the use of GPUs. They're sitting on just about every machine and they're typically underused. Um, we have, or I have a 3D version, but computationally, I think it fundamentally needs this kind of input. And obviously, the, the question after everything, do you have a Windows version? Yes, we're working on that, unquote. It's in the pipeline, and essentially, it's their top priority. So we have a two-pronged approach, headless comp compute nodes, and we can do everything that we can do at the moment on the Mac version on Windows. That's the, the wish, desire. Um, thanks. That's me, Stuart Hardy. That's my email address. That's my little company. Um, contact me. I'm on LinkedIn as well. It'll be easy to find. And for the moment, I think that's that. <laughs>